Hello everyone, I'm John Higgins and a warm welcome to my YouTube channel, John Higgins Film Review. Um, subscribe and like the content so we can help develop the channel and have more content like this. I'm delighted to welcome you all to a, this interview special with actor Mark Morahan, who plays Mark Parrott in Sean Cronin's latest film, Our Kid, which premiered at the 2023 Rain Dance Film Festival. Um, to summarise, it's a coming-of-age story about a Liverpool football mad girl and her family amidst ongoing challenges with her disabled brother. Mark, a warm welcome to you. Thanks for having me. So let's um, let's first go question, just for the those watching who may not have seen the film, what is the character you play and, in the con and tell us about the context of the film? Okay, so uh, my character's called Mark Parrott and he, uh, Laura, who is the young 12-year-old girl who loves fanatical about football. Um, I play her Uncle Mark. And most families have got somebody, a really close friend of the family that they, they call uncle or auntie or whatever it may be. So, so I'm not a real family member, but I'm as good as. Uh, my character's um, in his 50s and he's he's never grown up, really. He doesn't take life seriously. He's never settled down and had kids. So he treats the Riley family as his family, but he doesn't take life seriously. So... This uh, bites him in the backside uh, in the film, and uh, Mark and John have a have a row because John's going through some family upheaval, shall we say? And I don't without giving the plot away. Uh, so that's kind of how my my character fits in, in in the plot. But the premise of the story is the Riley family, typical Liverpool family. The twelve year old daughter Laura is a, is a great footballer, wants to grow up and play professionally for Liverpool Football Club. Her elder brother. Thomas is uh, has cerebral palsy and is bed bound and in a wheelchair, and it's the story about how the family cope with a uh, with sadness, loss, and how they they come together. But there's, I mean, it, it's it's a comedy as well, as I'm sure you know. Uh, so there's lots of lots of sad moments in there, but tremendous comedy moments in there uh, as uh, Ricky Tomlinson delivers most of the the, the funny lines. Um, and we've got a great cast. It's like a Brookside reunion. Lots of well-known Liverpool actors are in there. And uh, but it's it's a it's a a great story. And you don't have to be a fan of football or of Liverpool for that matter um, to enjoy the film. It's a universal story, I would say. And uh, it, it would appeal to anyone who likes a good laugh and and cry in mm. um, while watching a film. Yeah, it did. I have to say, it did take me back. I mean, meeting some of the other members, it was great because um, 40 years ago, I mean, when Brookside was starting out on Channel 4, I remember you, we used to watch the Omnibus edition on a Saturday afternoon and my parents would record it on our first ever VCR. And <laughs> it's not dissimilar to Sean Cronin's previous film, Give Them Wings, which is about Paul Hodgson, who had meningitis. And it's it's the same kind of thing, football and disability and stuff. But done in a very sensitive way, which is great. So I want to talk a little bit about your working relationship with Sean Croning and the other actors when you were working. I mean, I understand it wasn't a very long shoot, but you kind of bonded pretty well. Well, as I say, for, for most of us, it was like a reunion. I'd worked with most of the cast uh, quite a number of times over like 30 odd years. So we all know, we all know what, what each other's about really. And that helps when you, when you've, Got to hit the ground running when you've got a, a short schedule to work to. And I was busy when when we made the film. I had uh, I was rehearsing a play and on tour with the play, and I was doing another film. So I turned it down initially because I thought I, there's no way I can start learning more lines on top of everything else I was doing. But after reading the script and talking to Daniel P. Lewis, who plays Thomas brilliantly and also wrote and produced the film. He convinced me to, to play Mark Parrot, and uh, I'm glad I did because it's I'm proud to be a, a, a part of it, really. And uh, I don't know if I answered your question there, but no, no, <laughs> it's all right because um, I have to admit, Daniel P. Lewis, as I say, for anybody watching this, do watch this guy's performance because it's extraordinary. It's, it's hard to believe it was the same person at the party afterwards because I'm doing it. So let's talk a little bit about your own journey. I mean, you've mentioned already that you've you've done a lot of. Um, work with these people and you've worked on television so let's go back to the very beginning briefly and talk a little bit about what was the spot that got you into acting in the first place and also well, what were the things that kind of um come to mind from those early years okay well i started in primary school really um i was lucky that i i had a great teacher harry sir who obviously saw something in me and 
he cast me as Peter Pan when I think I was eight or nine years old. And that kind of gave me the bug. And then I was in every every school play on, and show from that moment on, really. And then when I went to secondary school, uh, I had a, another brilliant teacher, Peter Casey, who was uh, encouraged me, obviously saw something in me as well and cast me in, in all the school plays. And then the BBC came to came to our school auditioning for a Willie Russell TV play. Uh, it was a two-parter. And me and my friend got the two leads in it. So at, at the age of 15, I did my first TV role. And it was a fantastic experience filming in Liverpool on location. And we filmed at TV Centre in London. So that kind of, that cemented my my love for the profession, really. And then, uh, like lots of kids, I was I didn't have a clue about joining equity or what I needed, what steps I needed to do. So I uh, I went to work on a market stall for my auntie. And, um, and then I joined Unity Theatre in Liverpool and I was doing lots of shows with them, trying to get my union card because equity was a closed shop back in those days. Uh, and then sometime later on, I got my first agent, which was incidentally Ricky Tomlinson. So that was 1986. So all these years later, I'm still working with Ricky and he was my first ever agent. Um, so that's how long I've known Ricky. And... Um, and yeah, and then I got a few commercials. I did a, a cough and a spit playing a, a policeman on bread. And um, and then it just kind of went on from there. And the parts got bigger and better. And, and um, yeah, and the rest is history, to coin a yeah. cliche. Well, I I did quickly look through your IMDb. I mean, you've, you've played in a lot of great things. I mean, Coronation Street, Brookside and London's Burning, amongst others. I mean... What, how is working like stuff like that? I mean, what what do you feel do you what do you gain from when you're given the opportunity to be in these regular shows and stuff? How does that shape your acting? Oh, uh, I mean, because I started in theatre. So, well, I did start in telly when I was 15, but your bread and butter to begin with for most actors is theatre because it's more uh, accessible for, for most, most people starting out. So the two very different things and i mean the things i get from theater are the the immediacy of an audience and you can't beat that round of applause and and the audience is you know they let you know they've enjoyed the piece you're in but with film and tv you don't get that so so it's a different different sense of satisfaction i love the craft of making films and it's it's such a team game and i love being part of a team that that are all all the cogs are going around at the right moments and, and you just sit, watch it come together. And I love the process from sitting down at the table with me, you meet all your cast and crew and you read the script for the first time. And, and it, when it, when it, it comes out as you've imagined and you've got all these actors going, yeah, that's how I, that's exactly who, who I thought, how it was going to be played. And, and, and that for me is magical. So when you get to, to transfer that, on the film set, and the and the director says action, everyone comes alive, and and that process, that's the buzz I get making TV and film. So I hope that makes sense. Oh, it very does. Different. Okay, so my next question, I've got to err on the side of caution because um, I actually was talking to people about this. I, I met a couple of Liverpool writers at a at a, an event, and they kind of took offence to what I was about to say because I was, and. I, I also note, and I couldn't help, I had to can't let this pass, is that you worked on Harry Enfield and Chums as oh, one did, of yeah. the Scousers. So I'm was, just curious yeah, yeah. to know that, you know, first of all, it was it was well, those characters were well read. I mean, we we don't want to go into that because of the stereotypical. But I wanted to ask you about what was it like working with Harry Enfield? And tell us a bit about, you know, the kind of, when you were doing those scenes and those sketches, I mean, what was it like working on those? Yeah, well, Harry and Wilden Chums, it was, it was, it was of its time, you know. Uh, it, some scousers took offence. I mean, I was, I suppose, I was a bit naive when we did it, but I had a ball. I had such, I had such a good crack. I mean, I didn't directly work with Paul Whitehouse, but I spent a lot of time with him, and I knew Kathy Burke for, through a friend of mine. Uh, and we, and we used to all drink in the old Red Lion in, in the Angel in Islington. And there was a big gang of actors and performers who used to frequent there. And there was a, a theatre upstairs. And, and Perry Fennick, who was a good mate of mine, 
Uh, I used to spend most of my time staying in, in his flat in Barnes Green. And so I met all these people and then getting the Harry Enfield job, that kind of, it was like, it was like, I'd, uh, it was like, it felt like home because I knew lots of the people before I, I did the gig. So for that reason, it was very enjoyable. The stereotypes and, and all that stuff that, that went with the Scousers. Most Scousers have got a sense of humour and we get the stereotype, but, but I, I think we're able to laugh at ourselves because of the city is is well known for its humour and its humorists and, and performers. So for me, I got the stereotype, but I wasn't that offended because it was based on, originally it was based on Barry Grant, mm-hmm. Brookside. It was based on the Brookside Terry and Barry and Brookside because they were always arguing and fighting and that's where the characters came from. And then it kind of, he created, Harry created a monster in the end. And it, it morphed into something other than what it was when it started. And Terry McDermott, of course. So, and Graham Souness, although he wasn't a scouser, he played for Liverpool. And they all had the curly perm moustache. So it was a, it was an amalgamation of, of those things that became the scousers. And whether you love them or hate them, you know, there's no denying they were funny, in my opinion. So, yeah, yeah I mean, it was just, it was of its time, though. You know, I, I don't think Harry would repeat that kind of stuff nowadays, you know, it's just, but it was of its time and, you know, things don't age well nowadays, I, I find. Mm. Um, you know, if you look at stuff like Benny Hill and I've I've looked on YouTube and you see old Benny Hill thing, cause as a kid, I love Benny Hill, but you watch it back and you think, that is bloody awful, you know? Oh, yeah. It's, it's, I mean, but, it's, but it's of its time. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, the funny thing is, is um, they've been playing that on the, the Freeview channel, That's TV. I actually watched a recent, I watched a, an episode of Benny Hill and Kenny Everett recently. And you, I have to agree, it's like, you know, the whole thing that we see in those characters. But I think there was a... But I think there was kind of a charm. I mean, at the time when those characters came out, because it was all also it was also part of a cohesive whole because he had the old gits and he had everyone else. So moving away from that, I noticed that you were you were also a narrator on the series Thomas and Friends, which is totally different. I was. And tell us a bit about that. I mean, obviously, when you're when you're doing narration for a particular thing like that, what is your process? What I mean, is there any any advice you could give to people if they're if they're looking to be a narrator in something? What advice would you give? Well, it's a very tough market, you know, uh, voiceover. Even I mean, and you you tend to get pigeonholed, and they use a lot of the same people. It's very difficult to break into. But I was lucky. I got I auditioned along with. Every Scouse actor I know, I bumped into a lot of the through the audition process, and when I decided to to audition for it, I to start with Ringo Starr did it originally, then Michael Angelis did it, and they had a same a similar voice quality. So I thought, okay, well, not n- people don't like change generally, so I decided to do an impression of Ringo and Michael Angelis. So and I got the got the job. So when I got the job, I started to rein it in and kind of make it my own. Um, so that was that was I think how I got the gig because I didn't I didn't give give them too much change. I I I thought well I'll give them what they're used to kind of thing and that seemed to work. But um, but the actual process is you know you you've got you have a director. You all you can do is in interpret the story like like every actor does, and and you've got a director there to steer you in the right way and. And they, you know, they say, well, that intonation might not work. Try it another way. So you're guided by, you're guided by the the, the producer's notes. You're guided by the director. So you, you just give them what you hope they want. And I often, because I did it remotely during lockdown. So when I was recording from home, if we weren't recording the live sessions, I would I would record myself and then send them the t- the, the the files. I would give them four or five options for each each sentence say so they could pick and choose what what intonation they wanted because not having a director there so, and that seemed to work uh, okay um yeah and i did that for probably i don't know seven eight years i think i was narrator uh, storyteller for thomas and i still do the odd uh, thing for them occasionally like uh, games and stuff like that and uh, so yeah it's, it's it was a lovely job to do and you know it's such an iconic character thomas and to, to, so to be, a, and I followed in some amazing uh, footsteps. Like I'm a big uh, George Carlin fan, the American comedian who's no longer with us, and he did it for for a, a while in America. So to follow in his footsteps, 
you know, I mean, I was very lucky uh, to do that, and and I I had a great time doing it. But you know, not everything lasts forever, so it's onwards and upwards onto the next thing. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about your other creative juices. I mean, I understand you were also have been a writer on a thing called Cockney and Scouse. I mean, you, when you think about writing alongside your acting, I mean, what how how does that what does that bring to the table, and and what sort of is do you feel it's a therapeutic thing that you can do as a yeah? Writer? Well, kind of the writing side has has generally been, but I've written stuff that for my my I've, I've written lots of ideas down that I've never really. Uh, pushed you know forward and and everything i've I've written has been somebody else's idea and i've embellished it or or, or changed tack or you know or, or yeah just kind of ran with whatever their their story has been so i've always everything i've written is i've had the source material to work with and i i kind of enjoyed that process more than creating something from scratch so yeah, so everything, uh, as I say, Cockney and Scouse was was uh, we we shot a pilot during lockdown. It was uh, a treatment for ten episodes. It's a fantasy thing. I won't go into it because it's very long and convoluted. But um, but they had this idea for for this series, Cockney and Scouse, about these two ex special service guys who who are over the hill, and it, it's kind of a, a black comedy. And they they take this pill called Genome X that gives them superpowers. So it's a fantasy thing. And we had this pitch. So we shot a, a 15 minute short uh, and we we entered it into a, a dozen film festivals and we won a few and we got finalists and semi-finalists and blah, blah. But then to get it made would cost an absolute fortune, you know. And as, I, as, it, as the profession, it always springs up a job for somebody. And then one actor goes that way, another one goes that way producer goes another way so it, it gets shelved and you know whether we ever revisit it I don't know but it was a great experience and I directed it during lockdown so again I like that directing as well and I've I've done a couple of things now and hopefully I'm, I'll be doing a a film with the same guys from, from our kid we're doing a, a thing called Amazing Grace next year which I'll be directing so you know you, you, you go in different directions uh, throughout your career, I think, as an actor, and things fall into your lap accidentally, or so I've I've never really uh, let an opportunity go when it when it comes my way. If I like the challenge, then I'll have a go. So the writing thing is is always on the back of somebody else's creation, and I try and make it better than it than it it, it was. Okay, so we're going to wrap up the interview now, Mark. I've just got to ask you one final question, which is, what are you most proud of about your career to date? What am I most oh dear? Um, I, I suppose uh, for, I, I've had a varied and uh, varied career, the variety, and I'm and I'm sixty years old now, and I'm still here. So I think I think the fact that I've I've lasted as long as I have, I left school with no qualifications, and I was I was fairly single minded about want, wanting to become an actor, and, and and I achieved that against the odds, if you like. So so I think. The fact that I stuck to my guns and uh, and I'm still here, age sixty. So I, I see that as a as as a, a nice achievement, a personal achievement. So I don't shout it from the rooftops, but I suppose you know uh, I'm, I'm proud of that fact. Okay, well, listen, Mark. Thank you so much for your time and insights today. I mean, as mentioned, Our Kid is a fantastic movie. I saw it at the Rain Dance Film Festival, and it went down incredibly well at the um the screening and uh it it was yeah uh, well yeah. I, I must i must add it's it's on uh, amazon prime apple tv google play and youtube pay-per-view right now and uh, it's i think it's going to come out on a few more platforms in the near future so uh, it's out there I, I just go and watch it because it's a fantastic little story and uh, and if you like tears and laughter then our kid is for you well, I couldn't have put it better myself, Mark. Thank you very much for doing that extra bit of promotion. Um, so just wrapping up, uh, please do go to the YouTube channel, subscribe and like and watch more content like this. Uh, we've got lots of interviews with people like Mark and everybody else. Uh, and we interviewed Catherine Mary Stewart and Diane Franklin recently for their projects. Um, you can also look at my um, interviews, articles and reviews at www.filmandtvnow.com and also check out my new film resource website, www.watchmovie.co.uk. So on that note, Mark, thank you again and thank you all for watching. Lovely talking to you. All right.